before Steve brings a message to us, our reading this morning comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 35 to 58. In the NIV, it's headed, The Resurrection Body. But someone may ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed. Perhaps of wheat or something else. But God gives it body as he has determined, and to each kind of seed he gives its own body. All flesh is not the same. Men have one kind of flesh, animals have another, birds another, and fish another. There are also heavenly bodies, and there are earthly bodies, but the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind, and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has one kind of splendour, the moon another, and the stars another. And the stars differ from stars in splendour. So, will it be with the resurrection of the dead, the body that is sown is perishable? It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonour. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written. The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth, the second a man from heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And it is man from heaven, so also those who are of heaven. And just as we have Born the likeness of the earthly man, so shall we bear the likeness of the man from heaven. So I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. And listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, the mortal with immortality, When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? Death, O death, is your sting. The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. And always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. This is the word of the Lord. Amen.
Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. Sometimes when we read it, it does feel a little foreign to us. And we wonder if we can really understand, as is the case with this passage. Father, I pray today for us to have a better understanding of our destiny. Because if we do, Lord, then our life here will be so much um, more meaningful and uh, purposeful. Bless you, Lord. Amen. I don't know what you thought about that passage. It's, uh, well, it's long to begin with. Uh, it's not one that we read very often in, in church life, I don't think. Um, and I didn't really actually have it, have it read because I'm going to preach on it. That might, that might please some of you. <laughs> At least not today. And that, we may say that for another occasion. Um, but I wanted you to see the, the thought process that, that goes through Paul's mind when he thinks about death and resurrection and the afterlife and all that. Actually, it's a bit more complicated, perhaps, than some evangelical Christians might, might have of it. Um, but anyway, enough for that now. I want to explain to you, first of all, why I've decided to do this short series. Um, I was reading a book recently, or rereading a book recently, called Evangelism in a Spiritual Age. And in this book, they had done some research, or for this book, they'd done some research into what questions people uh, asked. It was several years ago, but I don't think it would have changed much in that period of time. Um, and uh, it didn't matter uh, what these people, what background they came from. It didn't matter um, what spiritual or, or social beliefs they, these people had. They all were asking similar questions. And um, the questions were, were these. Destiny, what happens after we die? Purpose, why are we here? Uh, the universe, accident or design? Is there a God? Uh, what about the supernatural? And the final one, why is there so much suffering? Now, I'm sure you can identify with all of those things. Probably you've had people who weren't believers or maybe they were, uh, you know, they, they were concerned about some aspect. They, they, those questions come up time and time again. And it, it's so funny because I hadn't finished my message uh, yesterday when we started the, um, uh, the, the, the big day, uh, the Uckfield Festival. I hadn't finished my message then. And um, I've got a great illustration <laughs> from that that I could mention this morning because I met a man there um, who spoke to me for nigh on 10 minutes. And in the process of that, I hardly said a word. Um, we, did, we, did, we did leave on good terms and I did, we did change, exchange email addresses. But it was so interesting. When I reflected, when I got back home again and I was finishing off for this, when I reflected on the things that we talked about, he talked about five of those six questions in the, in the course of that, that, those few minutes together. And I thought, wow, that's just a confirmation to me that these are the things that go through people's minds so often. The only one we didn't really touch on was why is there so much suffering? But every other question, every other question we touched on or he had an opinion on or he had a feeling about. And um, it just made me realise once again that that's what people out there um, are thinking about and the sad thing is that they don't necessarily go to the Christian church to find the answers. And yet, as I hope to show over these next few weeks, it won't be every week, but over these next few weeks, we do have answers, friends. We do have answers for all of these questions. They may not be clear cut entirely, but we do have answers. We shed lots of light. Well, I say we. God sheds lots of light through his word on these questions. So we start off with the, with the mm, gr grimmest one, may I say? I don't know. Depends. You know, on the surface of it, you think about this. You think, well, mm, not a subject necessarily um, I want to deal with. And I, several times I thought to myself as I prepared for this, was it a good idea? <laughs> was looking at this series was a good idea, particularly starting with this one. Couldn't I have changed the order around a bit? I just followed the order that they came up in this book that I read. Incidentally, in this book, they don't give any answers to these questions. So <laughs> um, but, you know, this was the first one. So on the surface of this, this isn't, isn't a particularly pleasant subject. But we're talking about something that, that is um, going to, we're going to all face unless Jesus comes again. 
there is nothing more certain in life than death. The Bible itself says in Hebrews 9.27, people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. You can't be clearer than that, can you? Um, I don't expect that gets preached on too often either these days, but it perhaps should be because we need to know these things. In uh, 1789, one of the America, America's founding fathers, uh, Benjamin Franklin, wrote what was probably his last and greatest quote. He said, our new constitution is now established. Everything seems, uh, sorry, everything seems to promise that it will endure. But in this world, nothing is certain except death and taxes. Mm -hmm. He died five months later. He was actually very ill at the time. Um, but if it's so certain, then it's sensible, it's important that we understand what it's all about. Yet for most of humanity, despite this inevitability, they stick or we stick our heads in the sand. You know, most people don't bother to write a will. Most people don't think about a funeral plan. Most people don't plan their funerals. And yet, it's going to happen. But why? Because it's too awful to think about for most folks. I think, I think it's Woody Allen that sums it up really well in one of his quotes. He said, I'm not afraid of death. I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> I mean, I guess a lot of people feel like that, won't they, in a sense? And he makes another uh, equally funny yet insightful comment about death. He writes a lot about death and things, but he, he has another one. He says um, about his own mortality, I don't want to achieve immortality through my work. I want to achieve immortality through not dying. I don't want to live on in the hearts of my countrymen. I want to live on in my apartment. <laughs> he, he sums up what so many people would feel about this whole subject, about, about da death. This passage that we've just read, this passage that we read in, um, in uh, Corinthians, gives some of Paul's perspective on what's going to happen um, to believers uh, after death. He speaks of new bodies, he speaks of resurrected bodies that are completely imperishable. They're, nothing, they're going to be nothing like, in, in many ways, nothing like the bodies that you and I have right now. In verse 42 he says, so will it be with the resurrection of the dead? The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. Friends, <laughs> I hope you like this. When you die, you're going to get a big makeover. <laughs> you really are. Like nothing you ev could ever have here. It's going to be absolutely amazing. And this is a destiny. This is the hope that we, as followers of Jesus Christ, have to offer the rest of the world. Now, people get excited about the latest serum that you can smother on your face, which has got hydrochronic something acid in it. I don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> something like that. What was it? What's it called? Acid. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> Every advert you see these days for these products has got, you know, that's what their, their big thing is, isn't it? Well, friends, you don't need that. You've got a better one coming in glory. Anyway, let's get just a little bit more serious for a moment <laughs> on, on what is a, 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 obviously a sombre subject. Life after death and the resurrection of the body. Now, every New Testament writer will, will convince you, will show you that you know, there is life after death. There's no doubt about that in any of the, the writings, but... There is, when you start delving a little deeper, some sort of um, differences about the things that the way that they're put across. And I think it's important for us to understand that because if we're not careful, we get a very sort of clear-cut idea in our minds about you know, what follows on from death. But think about this for a moment. When Jesus was hanging on the cross next to that uh, criminal who he was uh, crucified with, he said... Um, truly I tell you, this is Jesus, today you will be with me in paradise. Remember those words? This was at the point at which the man was almost about to die, but he'd obviously acknowledged Christ uh, and uh, 
one assumes in some way, shape or form, had accepted that he was who he said he was. And this man, Jesus tells him, would appear with him in paradise that day. Um, but then on the other hand, if you read in 1 Thessalonians 4, um, you get uh, an idea of what the state of the believer is after death. And this is from verse 13. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who, have, who sleep in death, so that you will not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus uh, died and rose again, and, we, uh, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. A little different, wouldn't you say? A little different. Paul goes on in verse 16 to say this, The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. This, re this particular reading seems to suggest that believers are not resurrected immediately with new physical bodies until after Jesus returns. And yet Jesus tells the criminal on the cross with him that he'll be with him today in paradise. So does that create a problem? Certainly if you just look at it on the surface, there could be. Can both the ideas of what happens at death, what happens after death, can they both be correct? Can we, can we die and be with Jesus immediately if we're believers, but be resurrected once um, Jesus returns the second time? Well, perhaps we need to think a little bit more carefully of our understanding about how this uh, occurs. The meaning of life after death for believers in the Bible is, is marked by two distinct emphases. Emphases. The first is that our soul is immortal. Yeah, that doesn't die when our body dies. The only bit that dies, as, as we read in our passage today, is the bit that's perishable, the body. This, you know, Paul says elsewhere, doesn't he, in the scriptures, that in each day my body is wearing out, but my spirit's being, my soul is being renewed because that's eternal. And if I allow that to be fed by God, then I'll be even more effective for him. So, so there is a, there is a, a permanency, there's an immortality, um, immortality rather, sorry, in the um, spiritual, in the soul. But then we are, we are going to get this physical makeover as well. But it would seem from the scriptures that that won't happen until Jesus comes again. Now, of course, then you could throw into the whole thing, well, God is outside of time. And for him, a day is like a thousand years or a thousand years is like a day. And so maybe all of this does happen at the same time. I just throw that out there, not to um, unsettle any of you particularly, but just to show that perhaps sometimes um, uh, our, our, our theology that we have, that we've perhaps grown up with, is not always entirely as clear-cut as we might think. But, and this is the important thing, Stop for a moment. It's easy to be overwhelmed by the mechanics or the theology of all of this. But for most of us, actually, that's not so important. The most important thing is the hope that this generates for us as followers of Jesus Christ. Because death is not the end. Actually, <laughs> death is the, sorry, life is the preface to the rest of the story. This life, it's, a, it's just that small, it could almost be the acknowledgements. I don't know what you want to describe it as, but it's such a small slice of the whole book. You know, when we've been there 10,000 years, there'll still be plenty left to praise God, as the, as the hymn writer puts it. It is, it's that change in, in, in re not in relationship, it's that change of, of venue, I don't know, what, call it what you like, <laughs> but it will be so much better than what we have now. Jesus to Nicodemus, those famous words, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, you won't perish, but you will have eternal life if you believe. I hope that gives you hope. I hope that enables you to have 
uh, a real meaning for life. You know, some people go through this life without any real meaning. They don't know what it's about, why they're here, and, lo- and don't, why is there so much problem with um, anxiety and depression and all those sorts of things right now? Now, don't get me wrong, Christians get those things as well, and this isn't a panacea for all of that, necessarily. But if we get ourselves to a place where we, we know our eternal destiny, then that will help with the way that we live here and now. It does matter. The future does matter because it impacts on the present and how we live out our lives. Jesus said this in John 8, If you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You know the truth in your eternal destiny. That sets you free for how you live in this life here and now. Knowing the truth makes our lives more confident, more purposeful. If we have some answers to some of those questions, and hopefully we'll have some more answers in coming weeks for those other areas, then we have the hope. So what next? Well, we need to prepare to give an answer to others who might answer that question. It's, right, it's okay to say to people, well, it's a little bit complicated, but actually, the truth of it is, there is hope for those who believe in Jesus Christ. As Peter writes it this way, in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Have a worship for God in all that we say when we talk to others. But be gentle, be very gentle. with Even the person who comes at you ranting, you know, and claiming to be the most uh, uh, fanatical um, atheist, when they've had their chance of shouting, if that's what they need to do, they will get to a point where they've got that out of their system and you can talk to them gently and respectfully about the things that really matter. And this is why we need to know some of the answers about these questions. It's not an academic exercise. It is an exercise of helping other people in the places where they are and in encouraging them to come to the place where we've found I hope, when I talked to that gentleman yesterday, I say talked, when I listened to that gentleman yesterday, I hope that the fact that I listened will have been as much benefit as anything that I might have said. I did say a few, one or two things, but not very much. And there is the ability to carry on that conversation, and I will carry on that conversation with him, Because at the end, I felt like he'd got things off his chest that he wanted to get off his chest. And we were probably at a place where we could start talking Mm. in a constructive way. Mm. That's, I don't hold that up as a particularly good example, just the most recent one I've run into, if you like. Um, But for all of us, you don't have to have all those answers there and then. But just to listen to these people as they ask their questions and know that you do have some hope to offer them. Let's pray. Lord, what can we say? We thank you for your word that gives us the assurance that where we will be when that most definite of things happens, that we leave this place and go to be with you. Lord, most of our world is devoid of any answers on that subject. Lord, that gentleman I spoke to yesterday, he even said at one point that he thought believers were lucky because they had a faith. And although I wouldn't describe it, Lord, in those words, we are blessed by you beyond measure in knowing our eternal destiny. Father, I thank you 
I thank you again. And I, I pray that my brothers and sisters, as we wake up every morning, we would thank you once more, not just for this life, but for knowing that we've got a life forevermore. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.